so hi guys welcome back to my channel Deb's Corner it's Deb here I'm wearing the same thing from a previous video I'm recording two videos at once that's okay um so I wanted to talk about grieving during the pandemic all right this is a little sad it's a sad video but it's okay it's part of life we have losses in life and it's just part of life so I wanted to talk about grieving through the pandemic so April 2020, I lost my dad to COVID. Um, it was a very sad moment because I I prayed, we prayed that none of our family members would be affected by the pandemic. And I guess it was his time to go because God said otherwise. Um, but when we first heard the news that he got COVID, my dad, by the way, was 77. When I, we first heard the news that he got COVID, very surreal, felt very surreal because you've been hearing about all these things in the news. You've been hearing about people dying in the news and you just for some reason, at least for me, I didn't connect it to me or anybody around me because it didn't really affect anybody around me. So trying to be sympathetic, but yet still didn't feel like, oh, it's really touching anybody around me until I got the news that my dad actually had it my sister is a doctor um, and we were blessed that she was able to be with my dad the last two weeks of his life before he passed so we got daily videos of him in the hospital fighting COVID and I saw how COVID I would say fought through the body I saw how it rummaged through the body to attack its victims um, and it was sad um, just watching my dad go from he was the apparently he was dehydrated when he was admitted to the hospital for COVID my dad was at a rehab facility because he had trouble walking so we thought we think that he might have contracted it from somebody that worked there or a another patient so when he was admitted to the hospital I'm sorry if I cry in this video it's a little emotional when he was admitted to the hospital he was a bit dehydrated so that was strike one on him he was admitted also with pneumonia and pneumonia obviously I guess was coming from COVID there was a link between COVID and pneumonia so he had pneumonia as well so fluid in his lungs so when they did the I don't know what they call it x-ray sorry when they did an, an x-ray on his chest we could see the pneumonia which is fluid in his lungs and we could see COVID on, on the other side of his lungs and it was funny on the x-ray COVID looked like a white mass scary Again, we were allowed access to this because of my sister. She's a doctor. Um, so we saw that and it was like, oh man, like it was, it spread and it was like, oh man, is he gonna survive this? So we started, you know, treatment. My sister was hesitant in putting him in a ventilator because what she found out was that most people who, oh, this is emotional. I didn't expect to cry. Most people who were on a ventilator never made it out. So the idea was to not put him into a ventil ventilator. To fight this disease as much as we can with oxygen without him having a machine to do his breathing. So we went that route. So day one, he looked so weak, dehydrated like I said, skeletons look so weak. And we were like, wow, this this doesn't look like our dad. This looks like a different person. Um, just looking at him, he looked like a different person. So day one, we went through this whole process of just trying to stabilize him, trying to get some fluids into his body, trying to rehydrate re him, right? Because he was dehydrated. Let me take a breath. So he was dehydrated. So we worked on trying to get him rehydrated. Day two, he was getting a little better. His cheeks filled out. 
his body filled out. We, we were seeing less bones and we're like, okay, things are turning around. This is the dad that we knew. He looks, his face is coming back together. This is that that we knew. Day two, that was day two. He was also at a hospital that we were not comfortable with because of the level of service they offered. And my sister did her best to transfer him out of that hospital into her hospital. So he was transferred from that hospital into her hospital. And this is very therapeutic for me, but he was transferred from that hospital into her hospital. And she was then able to give him the level of care that she wanted to and that her staff would be uh, will be willing to give her. The hospital is known as, um, they're good with trauma, they're good with dealing with this kind of kinds of stuff. So he was transferred there and day three, we began treatment. Oxygen levels were dipping, you know, and as with COVID, there's a lot of things, it attacks everything. Oxygen levels were dipping, we put him on oxygen. He was hooked to an oxygen tube through his nose, day two from day one actually but day three it was like an uptake of oxygen because he was losing off his oxygen levels were low so they gave him oxygen and you can see him you can see that he was there but wasn't there so we would talk to him he would hear our voices but he couldn't open his eyes and the little when he did open his eyes he looked like he wasn't there like some kind of like somebody when they're confused and they're like trying to get bearing of their surrounding that's what he looked like so he would open his eyes look around but look very confused he would somehow recognize our voice um, and would kind of try to move um, try to talk because he was talking but not audible you can see his lips moving trying to get words out but it wasn't no words were coming out so we can see that he was alert we can see that he was trying to respond to our voices so he was there so that was day three day four day five seemed like he was still like getting you know still interacting with us I remember telling him oh dad you can do this come on you can fight this fight this you can do this blah blah just encouraging him um, and just giving him encouragement and I think on day five day six I noticed him like I said something very encouraging on the phone because by the way everything was through my sister who was in his room covered up geared up videotaping him and I don't think a lot of people had this access their loved ones died alone such a sad sad thing for you to die live your, all your life and then die alone so a lot of them died alone. So I was appreciative of the whole process that my sister incorporated, right? And in, in, in letting us have access, this access via phone. So we saw day, like I said, day five, day, day four, day five, day six. Um, I think day six, I was giving him a courage. Throughout that they were give, throughout those days, we were giving him a courage. But day six, I said something like, "Dad, you can do this. Fight this. You can do this." And there was a moment where like tears were just released from his side of his face, and I can tell at that moment he's hearing me. He's fighting hard to fight this, but the disease or COVID was actually trying to win, and that made me sad. There was a picture. I think I took a picture of that moment when the tear came out of his face. I will not put that on here because that those are private moments. And I took a picture and every time I look at that picture, I remember, okay, I remember the words that I said to him. I remember what prompted him to cry. And it makes me somewhat happy, somewhat sad, but it just makes me feel like, okay, he heard my voice. He knew I was there. Even though I wasn't physically there, he knew I was there. So when he cried, I was like, ah, oh. you can tell that cry, that tear was like, listen, I'm really trying hard but this thing is kicking my butt. Or it's just, okay, I'm I'm really trying hard and this thing is painful, I'm trying, but it's painful. Or I hear your voice, my daughter, and I'm trying. Whatever tr translation of those tears, the, 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 the whole thing I got out of that, that he was hearing my voice. So that was day six. Day seven, day eight, then started taking a turn for worse because he wasn't even opening up his eyes. He wasn't even speaking. Um, I think that's when everything started going really like, ah. So he wasn't moving, he wasn't speaking, he wasn't, 
he was just not there and he would open his eyes but you could tell he was it was like a blank stare now whereas before it was like oh where where am i where am i like trying to get a bear of my his surroundings now they day seven i think day eight day nine you started to see that he, when he opened his eyes with the little that he opened his eyes when he did open it it looked it was a blank stare like it was just blank like no one was there and we were like i was scared i cried i was scared my dad who raised me who was like very like my dad was very tough very annoying at times very tough but could handle his own very independent like don't don't bother me very quiet um introvert i would say sometimes but this guy to go from that to now a man who just looked like he wasn't there he like he left that was day eight day nine day 10 day 11 they got his oxygen level to I guess it was 90 something above 90 something so we were like hoping like okay he look he's day 10 sorry day 10 day 11 day 12 I'm mixed up my days those those three days 10 11 12 it looked like he was his oxygen levels back to over 90 and we're like okay it looks like he's pulling through it looks like he's making a yes so we were all happy so day 13 day 14 the social worker calls and he goes okay if your dad not if when your dad comes out he didn't say if he said when your dad comes out of you know fighting cover comes out of this this right where do you want him to go because he obviously has to go to a rehab or slash facility right because he was in a rehab center before where would you want us to take him after he's done with fighting COVID, right so we were all hopeful this was like i said um 13 14 right we're all hopeful we're like yes you know he's gonna pull through so he the social worker calls us and tells us that and we're like okay um you know let's let's do our research we have to do our research we'll get back to you so i went after that phone call so energized i started doing my research finding that place and we found a place and we called the social worker back and said oh this is the place is it is it going to be easy to transfer him to that location and he goes yes we were excited we're like thank god thank you jesus that was 13 14 we're so thankful jesus thank you jesus and then things took a turn for the worse um then took a turn for the worse because immediately after we had done that we noticed oxygen started going down again um my sister on the last the day my dad passed away my sister um had a shift at another hospital so this was her main hospitals but she tends to go to different hospitals to work so on the last day my dad passed away my sister wasn't able to be there um she came after so we saw the corpse of my dad right so apparently he had an heart attack due to covid and that was the end so he died of a heart attack related to COVID Whew. so my sister heard the news I think it was my dad passed away in the morning at 5 20 a.m. my sister heard the news and immediately when she left her shift we did ran to the hospital where my dad was or where my dad died or her hospital and at that time they had him in the body bag that they usually put the corpse in and they were getting ready to take him to the hospital ward and again because my sister's a doctor and that's a hospital she was allowed access into the room where he died So she gets into the room I, and she immediately calls us, our family members, and she pans the video over to him. And my dad is laying there dead in a body bag. But the weird thing about that, he looked like he was sleeping. He looked at peace. Looked like he was resting, like just at total peace. And I couldn't differentiate whether he was sleeping, but I know he was dead. But I didn't. I couldn't differentiate whether he was sleeping. And he looked like he was sleeping. So, a lot of thoughts went through my mind. It was like, okay, he looks like he's sleeping, but he's dead. Okay, I can't believe my dad is gone. Wow, my dad is really gone. All those emotions will kick in. But 
after all those emotions kicked in, I started crying uncontrollably. Uncontrollably. And I was like, wow, my dad is actually gone. So we had, a, my sister stayed with him for a while. And, you know, the carriers had to obviously, you know, zip him up and take him to the morgue. And my, we didn't get to see that part. But my sister says she watched, stayed there. They zipped him up. She stayed there while they carried him through the hospital hallways. And they carried him. She stayed there. She walked with them until they opened up the uh, hospital morgue, which was just a trailer, like a truck trailer. So they opened it, and she said she stood there. She watched them take him in, put him there. Okay, they came out, and they closed the door. And she was like, at that moment, she started crying because she just realized she's not going to see her dad anymore. You're in there, you're gone. So that was the whole ordeal. And then apparently we wanted to go back home to where we're from and have a burial for him there but you couldn't carry a covid riddle body on a plane so we had to cremate out that so we cremated we cremated out that he was cremated was that the vision i had for him in my thoughts because i know my parents have to go but was that the vision I had for him when he had to go? No, I never thought about cremation, not something I thought about. I wanted to have a physical body buried. Because just in case in the future you want to do some kind of observation or blah blah blah, the bone is still intact. So never wanted to do cremation, but we had to do it. So he was cremated a month later because the crematories, the funeral homes, everything was booked. You couldn't get anything like as soon as you wanted it. It had to be like a month or two in advance. So the grieving process began way before, you know, the cremation, a month before, obviously, when he passed. I think the month, the week or two after he passed, I was on this mode because I took off charge. I was on this mode to just take care of all his affairs to get things closed, um, to finalize his rehab centers if he owed any money to finalize that, if they owed us any money to finalize that, to take care of all his affairs, to book um, the cremation, to book uh, the whole funeral, and to, to fill out applications for his death certificate, all that stuff. I was so engulfed in that, that when I finally finished all that, I broke down. I was like a, a zombie, right? I remember one time sitting out, looking out in the window, and it was sunny, birds were chirping, it was a spring day, birds were chirping, it was just, it was just sunny, birds were chop, chirping, it was nice. I was looking out the window and I was like, wow, I, I see the sun, I see the sun, I see beauty around me, I see flowers, I see greenery, but I can't really feel it, I can't really take it in, why? And that's what grieving does, it blocks, it blocks everything. So. That was when grieving started after I took care of all his affairs. And to tell you, the first few weeks when you somebody dies and people call you, you know, you get phone calls, you get prayers, you get a bunch of stuff, right? The first few weeks, right? People are like, oh, I'm so sorry about your this, that, that. You feel confident, okay, cool. But then after that, it goes silent. You hear nothing, you're alone with your thoughts. And those were the moments that were really hard. I had my siblings to comfort me. I'm married. My husband tried his best to comfort me too as well. So I have my husband, I have my siblings to comfort me. Um, and it was just to a point where you just had to deal with it on your own. You had to go through the processes of grief. You have to deal with it. In order to come out on the other side better. Moving through the pandemic made me feel like I shouldn't... Um, if I'm grieving, I shouldn't let people know. I shouldn't, I should keep it to myself because everybody has had, almost everybody has known somebody, has somebody or have heard of somebody that died of COVID. So it's like, it was like my story wasn't anything new. It's just like everybody, hey, welcome to the um, group. Everybody, well, not everybody, somebody knows or somebody has had somebody or heard somebody who have died of COVID. So welcome to the group. Yes, we're sorry it happened, but can you try to get over it? Because this is not, you're not the only person that has to deal with this. And that's how I felt during the and grieving in the pandemic, because that I had to just quietly deal with it on my own, except with the exception of my husband and my kids, uh, I'm sorry, my husband and my siblings, I had to deal with everything on my own. And that was sad. 
been a year plus and I still am grieving. I still want to tell the story of my dad and I am going to tell the story of my dad in this channel, but I still want to keep his memory alive and I'm still grieving. I still can't believe he's not here, but that's what death does to people, right? You, once one minute you're, you, so one minute you're used to seeing them and the next minute they die, you're not used to seeing them. That's what death does to you. So. I wish he was here, but he's not, but I want to keep his memory alive. And I promised myself that I will keep his memory alive through a book, through this, or through something. I want my dad to be known. His first name was Daniel. Daniel. And he was an amazing man. Very complicated. An introvert, I think. But in his early years, he used to be an extrovert. But yeah, I just wanted to say grieving through the pandemic has not been easy because of the fact that you had to kind of bottle up your emotions or get over it as quickly as possible because everybody else was going through the same thing and that was bad because on a normal in a normal circumstance I would have the ears of others to talk through and deal with this I had a couple of friends who consoled me who were there for me my good friend and my good friends and who prayed with me I'm thankful for those without them I don't think I would have gone through the pandemic uh, through the grief grief or the death as well as I have gone through it. I am still grieving. It's a process. I don't think you ever forget those who have left us, but it's just trying to live a manageable life with the knowledge that they're not here anymore. Yes. So until my next video, I'll see you guys soon.